Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us for the webinar on Children's Health Homes, a training on complex trauma determination. My name is Meg Beyer. I'm a social worker at the McSilver Institute, and I'll be presenting today with Dr. Mandy Habib, who will introduce herself shortly. Before we get started with the content of today's webinar, I want to walk through some of the agenda items as well as housekeeping items. So today's webinar is going to cover a few different topics. We'll cover what is PTSD, what is complex trauma for New York State Health Homes, how does complex trauma differ from PTSD, we'll take a look at the complex trauma exposure assessment, we'll also talk through the complex trauma eligibility determination form and look at linking impairments to complex trauma exposure, as well as a review of the domains of impairment for those assessed. Additionally, just to remind everyone, the material that we're reviewing on this webinar has been taken from three of the in-person trainings that were offered around New York State this past February. Um, along with, the, with DOH, we went to Albany, Rochester, and New York City and did a full in-person training. We've pulled the slides from this webinar from those in-person training sessions. Also to remind everyone, the material that we're going to talk through today is current as of the date of the recording, which is May 2nd, 2017. So with that, I am going to pass along the presenter to um, my colleague today on the webinar, Dr. Mandy Habib, and she will walk through the rest of the material today. Okay. Thank you, Meg. So uh, I'm Mandy Habib. And I'm a clinical psychologist and uh, co-director of the Institute for Adolescent Trauma Treatment and Training out of Adelphi University in New York and co-chair of the National um, Child Traumatic Stress Network's Complex Trauma Workgroup. So I thought before really diving into things that um, I would talk very briefly about uh, what complex trauma is not. So as part of that, I'll go over P the PTSD criteria, but really just in, in brief. I'm not going to go over these criteria in detail. So often, but not always, PTSD occurs after a single event, so something like a dog bite, a natural disaster, an assault, or a car accident. The event can be interpersonal or non-interpersonal, and as a result of having experienced the event, you develop a particular set of symptoms that's often in direct response to that event or events. So if you're looking at criterion B, for example, you might experience symptoms of intrusion directly related to that index trauma. Just as an example, I worked with the first responder who'd been pretty viciously attacked by two large dogs while on the job. He had flashbacks and nightmares about what happened, so, so that would be criterion B. He began avoiding dogs and places where he might see dogs, so now we're moving into criterion C. So that meant he could only save people who lived in houses without dogs, and so not surprisingly, it was really impacting his ability to function at work and at home because he couldn't go to the park or other places with his kids either. So I, I give you these examples by way of uh, drawing a comparison between what PTSD is relative to complex trauma and, and what complex trauma is not. So this is what PTSD looks like, and complex trauma is distinct from this. You can be complexly traumatized and also have PTSD, but you can also be complexly traumatized without meeting full criteria for PTSD. So when you, when you look at some of the data that's been collected so far, and this is data coming out of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, where uh, many children have been seen in clinics in different types of settings, what we're seeing is that 78 about 78, 79% have experienced multiple types of traumatic events as opposed to about 21% that have experienced a single trauma. So multiple traumatization is really the norm with about 3.7 different types of traumatic events on average. So not surprisingly, the greater the number of traumas, the greater the comorbidity. So the more bad things happen, basically the more symptoms you'll have. And Although over half of the uh, children in this particular data set exhibited significant symptoms of post-traumatic stress that they were having you know, real problems with, about only 28% actually met full criteria for, for PTSD. So there can be, which means that about 71% did not meet full criteria. So there can be several reasons for this. One is that 
the children are resilient, which is often true, but that's not necessarily the case with these children because this is a, a clinic sample, so they're already seeking treatment. Or it could be that they are having difficulties, but that those difficulties are coming out in a different way that's not captured in a diagnosis of PTSD. And we know from experience that a lot of these children will have subclinical levels of PTSD or partial PTSD or other difficulties like depression or anxiety or attachment problems. So they are exhibiting and experiencing difficulties, but they're not being captured in that diagnosis alone. And when you look at some of these real-world indicators, so to speak, you see that more than half of these children are having problems with behavior at home and in the community, more than half are having academic problems, behavior problems in school, high rates of suicidality, and substance use as well. And I suspect that that substance use number might be higher if the sample included children just over the age of about 11 or 12 as opposed to including the real little ones. And so what you're really seeing is that, you know, children that have experienced multiple traumas develop a different set of symptoms. It's really the difference between a traumatic event, which can lead to PTSD, versus a traumatic life, which is often associated with complex trauma. So the question really is, and I think I've already alluded to the answer here, is does PTSD fully capture the impact of trauma? So. There's a general recognition that trauma underlies many conditions, including you know, oppositional defiant disorder, bipolar disorder, uh, conduct disorder, ADHD is a big one in the young ones, and then as they start to enter adolescence, you see a little bit more bipolar disorder. And there's a general agreement among the complex trauma community that there, that there is this constellation of symptoms that's not better accounted for by, by PTSD. So I just want folks that are, that are listening to this webinar to really think about the youth that you work with and the systems that you work in and how often you hear about children in child welfare settings or juvenile justice settings or residential settings having these different diagnoses. Uh, just by, by way of, of illustration again, I had a, a, a teenager, a, a, an older teenager walk into my office a couple of years ago and announced that she was bipolar and she needed medication. It was her first visit, the first time that I was seeing her in my office, and I did a complete trauma screen with her and found that she'd endured extensive physical abuse by her father for years, was bullied mercilessly in high school, and eventually wound up in a very abusive relationship. So although she was no longer experiencing any of those things when she walked into my office, she did describe what she called flipping out or going off on people for no reason. Those were her words. But when we dug a little deeper, we discovered that every time she flipped out, quote unquote, it's because she'd been triggered, either by a look that someone gave her that reminded her of how she'd felt in high school when she was bullied, or something that someone said that sounded like her father or her ex-boyfriend. So she had these very intense reactions to things and not know why. And oftentimes, at least initially, she didn't even know that she was being triggered. She just knew that she felt sad or mad or ashamed, and then she'd, quote unquote, flip out. So that's not a chemical reaction in her brain necessarily causing her to flip out. That's a complex trauma reaction to being triggered by something that made her feel bad. Now, she could also have bipolar. In her case, she, she did not. So I'm mentioning this because understanding why people are exhibiting the symptoms they're exhibiting makes a difference in terms of the kind of treatment that they receive. So it's really so important to get it right because that will inform treatment and that's really part of what's behind this whole initiative in terms of trying to understand and identify complex trauma. And so we'll talk about how to do that in just, in just a few minutes. First identifying exposure and then identifying and assessing impairment related to that exposure. All right, so what is complex trauma specifically as it relates to New York State health homes? Okay. So when you look at the essential parameters associated with the definition developed for, for New York State health homes, some of the essential features are that uh, the nature of the trauma exposure is interpersonal. It occurs in multiplicity and or recurring traumatic events. So you can have exposure, exposure to community violence layered on top of physical abuse, layered on top of witnessing domestic violence, so that would be the in multiplicity. And then within each of those, you can have multiple recurrences. For example, physical abuse, as with domestic violence, might occur daily or several times a week over years. Additionally, complexly traumatized children will typically or often present with multiple developmental and functional impairments. They'll also often carry multiple diagnoses. 
Okay. And as far as screening and assessment, it really involves assessing both the child's exposure to these multiple or recurring events as well as the wide-ranging and severe impact of the exposure across different domains of development. And there are a variety of tools provided that will help guide that assessment. And there are, there's a link here that provides some guidance around assessing impairment, and we'll go through all of this in detail in just a moment. So this is the um, definition that SAMHSA and CMS have provided and that New York State is using for this particular initiative. And essentially, the, the idea is that while there might be similarities in a lot of these symptoms that arise, you know, either in terms of complex trauma or serious emotional disturbance, the therapeutic approaches associated with those, those diagnoses will vary significantly especially when the symptoms are arising from traumatic experiences. So you really want to be able to identify why the symptoms are manifesting. So the, the first criterion is that the term complex trauma incorporates at least exposure to multiple traumatic events, often of an invasive interpersonal nature, and the wide-ranging long-term impact of this exposure. So really just a reiteration of, of something mentioned previously. Uh, the nature of the traumatic events is often severe, pervasive, such as in the case of profound abuse or profound neglect, usually begins early in life, can be disruptive to the child's development and the formation of a healthy sense of self, often occurs in the context of the child's relationship with the caregiver, and can interfere with the child's ability to form a secure attachment bond which is, as, as we know, is considered a prerequisite for healthy social-emotional social functioning. The definition also um, includes that many aspects of a child's healthy physical and mental development rely on the secure attachment as a primary source of safety and stability. And now this, uh, this, this D criterion here, this is really important because these are the impacts and the domains that you will be assessing. So wide-ranging, long-term adverse effects can include impairments in physiological responses and related neurodevelopment, emotional responses, cognitive processes, impulse control and self-regulation, self-image, relationships with others, and dissociation. So these are the seven domains of impairment that you'll be assessing in order to make the determination, and we'll go over these in detail as well. And I just wanted to briefly make a note about dissociation. As part of the initial New York State rollout of this initiative, dissociation was subsumed within the cognitive processes domain. It's since been pulled out as its own separate domain, and this is consistent with what's in the literature and on the uh, National Child Traumatic Stress Network complex trauma web pages. So how does complex trauma differ from PTSD? <clears throat> so, just to recap, PTSD can occur after one event, whereas complex, tri co complex trauma requires multiple exposures. PTSD can result from any type of traumatic event, including natural disasters, whereas with complex trauma, the traumatic event is by definition interpersonal in nature. PTSD has four criteria that need to be met, whereas complex trauma outlines seven domains of impairment. PTSD is a diagnosis in the DSM, complex trauma is not. However, it is a determination for health home eligibility in New York State. And if you would like more information on the uh, definition of complex trauma and a little bit more detail about it, you can, there are also some links to the NCTSN website below as well. Okay. So these are the forms and tools that are being used as part of uh, this initiative, and the ones that we are going to focus on today are the Complex Trauma Exposure Assessment Form, as well as the Complex Trauma Eligibility Determination Form, both of which must be completed by a licensed professional. And the, the complex trauma exposure screen, which we're not reviewing here, is reviewed as part of a previous webinar and is a prerequisite, so to speak, or the first step in getting somebody in for a more formal assessment of exposure. So whereas the complex trauma exposure screen mentioned as part of a previous webinar 
is um, more is sort of broader and casts this very wide net in terms of the number and types of exposures that children had to have experienced. The complex trauma exposure assessment is more comprehensive and may involve direct contact with the child and as such requires that a licensed provider complete it. And the criteria in order to, to meet eligibility as part of this assessment also begin to get a little bit stricter here and get tightened up. So initially we're casting a wide net trying to make sure that we're not missing any children and so they get through the door with a screen and then a more comprehensive assessment of exposure is done and that's where that, that net is tightened so that you're really capturing the children that need the services the most. Okay, so this is a screenshot of a complex trauma exposure assessment. I know it might be a little bit difficult to see. I'm not sure how it appears on screens. But these documents are also available for download directly, and I encourage you to do that as you follow along. So I'm really just going to, this is sort of the meat of this webinar, is knowing how to complete this. So I'm going to walk you through it as comprehensively and concisely as I can, and just we'll, we'll give an example of, uh, of how to complete it as well. So in completing this assessment, you want to make sure to use all available information. You want to complete each category. So there are about 14 or 15 categories that are a part of this exposure assessment, 15 if you include the other category. So there's more categories in the complex trauma exposure screen. And you, to the extent possible, don't want to leave them blank because you really want a clear picture of what this child has been through with the thinking that this is also a document and information that can be passed along down the line, not just for the determination of eligibility, but for therapeutic and clinical purposes as well. So wherever the information is, is available, you would like to include significant details of the event. So if you just sort of scroll down to the top half of this grid here where it says prompts and questions, you've got a particular category. So we'll look here, psychological maltreatment, emotional abuse or neglect. This would be the first category of um, traumatization. So you would indicate whether or not that is present, yes or no, and there are some prompts here, some suggested questions that you can ask. You would indicate whether the child has experienced that particular type of traumatic event for greater than 18 months. So if the answer is no, you would put an N. If it's yes, obviously you'd put a Y. You would indicate the age range, so it might be for the, a period between the ages of 6 and 8 or 6 and 9 and then it again between 11 and 15, or it might be multiple discrete events, in which case you would say you know, 9, comma, 13, comma, 14. And then you would indicate any characteristics about the event that you have information about. So was it verbal abuse, or was it emotional neglect, or was it extreme or harsh but non-physical punishment? And so here it's non-physical because this is the psychological maltreatment category, not the physical abuse category. And then if you have any additional information or details like um, the extent of injuries, let's say if it's physical abuse or if it's witnessing domestic violence, was it a victim of domestic violence or witness, a uh, relationship to the perpetrator, you would include those additional details here. So one thing to note is that when interviewing the child, it's obviously important to be sensitive to the child's level of distress. And you really don't need to dig down to try to get all of this information. If you have that information as far as the characteristics or the details included, if you don't have that information, it's not necessary to have it. That can be done later on during the course of treatment once a therapeutic relationship has been established, but certainly it's not necessary to gather that level of detail at this point. So you really want to complete those, those fields if you have the information already. And of course, at any point in time, you want to be mindful to how the child, if, if you're doing this as part of an interview, is responding to you as you ask the questions, and make sure up front that you provide them with the permission to say, I don't want to talk about that, or put up a stop sign with their hand, or say skip or next, if they want to go to the next question. And encourage them that you would rather that they, they just say next or skip as opposed to saying something didn't happen when it did. And for this assessment, you really want to gather information from as many sources as you can. So it could be uh, talking with the child, it could be caregiver report, clinical interview, reviewing records provided to by other agencies through the use of standardized instruments. So you want this to be as comprehensive as possible, again, thinking that down the line, 
that this could also be a tool for folks to use. So it might not always be clear whether a particular event rises to the level of a trauma, and so you really will have to use your clinical judgment in those circumstances. Additionally, some traumatic events may fit in more than one category. For example, physical bullying could also, considered, could also be considered to be an assault. So when that happens, just choose one category that you feel best describes a traumatic event. You really don't want to double dip. And the reason is because in order to be eligible, you have to have experienced at least two or more separate types of events. So you don't want the same one, even if it could fit into two different places, to count twice. So it's either two or more, or one lasting greater than 18 months. Now, for young children between the ages of zero and five, there's a little bit of latitude there because chronic exposure can, can, can be checked off for periods less than 18 months. If you think about it, you know, a child who's 12 months of age may only have been, only, quote unquote, have been exposed to traumatic events for six months, but that's more than half their, half their life. So there is that latitude to use your judgment. And also for children that are really that young, and especially between zero to three, that developmental period is so critical because they are so fully dependent on their adult caregivers. So we've tried to incorporate some flexibility here as well while still constructing something that has some objective criteria. So after completing the assessment, you make a determination as to whether the child has been exposed to complex trauma based only on interpersonal traumas experienced or witnessed, right? Because the interpersonal traumas are part of the definition. This assessment also includes a very brief section for non-interpersonal traumas as well. And that's because if you're going through all of this, you may as well include the other information that you have, but you will not consider non-interpersonal traumas in making this determination. And then you see a section that allows you to check off where you got your sources of information, whether it was the parents or the child or through a structured interview or review of records or standardized instruments. And then once you go through all the different categories, the document is about five pages in total, you tally up that column that says present, yes or no, at the bottom, and as long as you have two yeses, they would meet criteria, or uh, and again, you tally up the column that says greater than 18 months. As long as you have one yes for greater than 18 months, they would also meet criteria based on that. Okay. So now that we've gone through the form in abstract, uh, we'll review it again uh, using a uh, video that was shown as part of another but related webinar uh, that illustrated how to complete the complex trauma exposure screen, which is that initial referral screen. And for, for that webinar, we reviewed the uh, video removed up until the first four minutes, I believe. So this kicks off from, from where that left off. And I'll pause in just a moment and allow folks to find that link and view the tape. But essentially, uh, it's, a, it's a story about a young girl named Zoe. Zoe is nine years old. She's a Caucasian girl living with her mother, stepfather, and her younger brother. The parents have a violent relationship that's been witnessed by both of the children. She recently went to school with bruises and black eyes. A report was made to CPS, which resulted in her and her younger brother being removed from the home. She was separated from her younger brother, who she often took care of and protected, and then placed into foster care. If you've not already seen the first four minutes of removed and want to, um, or you have but would like to refresh yourself, that might be helpful. If you have, then uh, just go ahead and start from the 4.41 mark up through 8.31. Okay. So. Hopefully folks have had a chance to review the video, and so now that you have, we're going to practice completing the complex trauma exposure assessment for Zoe, the young girl in the movie. So in thinking about the movie, what types of complex trauma exposures has Zoe experienced? So if you're thinking about just the first four minutes of the video, assuming you've already seen that, we already know that she's witnessed domestic violence because you've heard parents arguing in the background and it's pretty strongly alluded to. You can surmise her some physical abuse. She shows up at school with black eyes and bruises. And now having seen the, the next segment, 
based on the new information, you can make a determination about um, having been removed from her home, where that would go. So in the, I'm just flipping to my own documents as well so that I can be up to speed with everybody on this webinar. So looking at the uh, displacement category versus the attachment disruption category, you can make a determination as to whether or not she would better fit under displacement or better fit under attachment disruption. And so remember, she could probably fit in both places. And this is one of those areas where we're also trying to make some adjustments. So somebody had, uh, there's a little bit of overlap between these two different categories. So displacement we're thinking of, at least initially, in terms of physical displacement. So the emphasis is more on, on the physicality and being removed from the home, and there's a characteristic for foster care placement that you can check off to indicate that. So I would probably in this case choose that, but you could also make a really strong argument for this fitting under attachment disruption. I think an attachment disruption was really intended to capture less about the physical location and separation, more about a disruption in the attachment, even if you are still living with a caregiver, so to speak. But I think that in this case, you can make the argument for, really for either, but I would probably put it under a displacement because if you're being removed from the home due to, uh, due to abuse, then you can assume that there's already been an attachment disruption. This is one of those areas where you can look toward the future and there will probably be some changes so that this is a little bit tighter and the categories uh, have less overlap and are a little bit cleaner. So New York State at this point is one, might be the only state so far that is actually allowing complex trauma to be a single qualifying uh, condition for health home eligibility. And so it's a wonderful thing, but it also means that it's a little bit like riding a bicycle while you're building it. So while we're in this construction phase, we everybody just has to be a little bit flexible and uh, kind of think on their feet. And at the end of the day, as long as you've captured it somewhere, I think that's really the most important piece here because we want to make sure not to miss any children. Okay, so now that you know that she has had at least three separate, if not more, but just based on this video, types of exposures, based on the complex trauma exposure assessment and on the video, what's your next step? And the next step would be to assess impairment. So based on what this child has experienced, how is this impacting her functioning and her symptoms? And so now we're moving to the complex trauma eligibility determination form. So the top half of this form lists all of the different categories of exposure which are captured in the complex trauma exposure assessment. So at this point, you already have enough information to indicate whether or not it's present, yes or no, and enough information to indicate whether or not it's a chronic, chronic exposure based on that definition of greater than 18 months, yes or no. So you're just summarizing the information from the complex trauma exposure screen in this upper grid and then any other additional information that you would like to include. Okay, so now we're going to link the exposures to how it's actually impacting symptoms and presentation and functioning along these seven domains. And these are the seven domains that I highlighted originally that are part of the complex trauma definition provided to New York State by SAMHSA and CMS, which are also consistent with the domains as they're described on the NCTSN National Child Traumatic Stress Network website. Okay, so this is a close-up view of what the domains are, and I'm going to provide a little bit more detail about what goes into each of these domains. Okay, so this is um, a grid that really, again, it lists the same seven domains listed on the previous slide, but it also lists some examples of what's included within each of the domains, and we're going to talk about them. I'll, I'll, I'll briefly review, give you a little summary of what each domain is about, and then we're going to link them to what we know about Zoe based on the video. And again, I know that the screens might not really uh, highlight, you might be sort of hard to read, and so I encourage you to download these documents directly from the website as well so that you can follow along or just have them as a frame of reference. So for physiology and neurodevelopment, you're really looking at things like somatic complaints, like headaches and stomach aches, uh, physiological overreactivity, like rapid breathing or heart pounding or panic attacks, or on the flip side, underreactivity, like shutting down, 
entirely, especially when presented with stressful situations. Sleep disturbances can include regressive behavior as well. For emotional disturbances and emotional responses, a lot of children will experience significant depression, anxiety, or anger. Emotional responses may be unpredictable or explosive. So even very mildly stressful interactions with other people might trigger these intense emotional responses, and it's as I had described in, in that client early on. Or kids may completely tune out, become emotionally numb to things, or become easily frustrated and overwhelmed. For impulse control and self-regulation, I'll just highlight a couple of these things. So again, intense, volatile, extreme reactions, poor modulation of impulses, could be aggression against others or property, so throwing things, breaking things, yelling, um, problems with self-regulation or attempted self-regulation that are maladaptive like substance abuse, engaging in self-harm, self-image, feeling worthless, frequent self-blame, low self-esteem, feeling somehow damaged or different than other people, viewing yourself as powerless, unable to change or really impact your future, and having few hopes and dreams or plans for the future. Relationship with others are also heavily impacted, so difficulty trusting other people, problems with boundaries, either trusting too much or trusting the wrong people or refusing to give any information or get close to anyone, and essentially really problems forming healthy attachments to caregivers. And then cognitive processes includes everything we think of in terms of executive functioning, including difficulty shifting tasks or activities, um, problems thinking a problem through calmly and considering multiple alternatives, so really problem solving, possible um, difficulty with concentration, and this can oftentimes look like ADHD, but a lot of times people will be distracted by trauma reminders and have difficulty sustaining attention. And then the final domain is dissociation. So this is really feeling detached from your body, uh, feeling as if you're in a dream, or that things aren't quite real, or it could manifest as having uh, significant memory gaps, uh, or appearing to space out or uh, tune out, again, especially when triggered. So these are the seven domains of impairment. And the reason that I, that I mention these in just a little bit of detail is because once you've identified that the child has experienced multiple traumatic events or one type of traumatic event but chronically over 18 months, you then need to assess impairment in these seven domains. And there needs to be impairment in at least two of the domains or a very acute impairment in one. So there's no one tool with which to do that. So you really do need to feel somewhat comfortable understanding what goes into each domain so that you can make that determination. And so for more information on what's covered in these domains, if you're looking for more information, you can also go to the NCTSN website, which has a, a narrative description and some case examples of these domains in, um, in somewhat different form. And the titles, though, on that website are a little bit different. They're very close, but they're not exact. So the bottom half of this grid provides a crosswalk for how to identify how they map onto one another. Okay. So before we shift into looking at Zoe's, uh, the difficulty she's having and the impairments that she's exhibiting, I just wanted to, to once again draw a distinction between the assessment of complex trauma exposure versus assessing complex trauma impairments and symptoms, because they're very different things and sometimes there's some confusion. So exposure is just essentially what has the child experienced, what happened, not how they're responding to it, but just what happened. And to assess exposure, you're only using the complex trauma exposure screen, the CTES, or the complex trauma exposure assessment, the CTEA. And these tools were specifically developed to determine health home eligibility in New York State. And in a moment, I'm going to direct you to a website that has a whole list of different tools and on that website, there are tools for both exposure and for assessing impairment. So you have to make sure that you don't, you can look at the ones that assess exposure, but you don't use those. You have to use the CTES or the CTEA that's already predetermined. Then assessing impairments is really just assessing, you know, after you know what's happened, what is the impact or manifestation of what happened. And for that, you can choose tools from the NCTSN website. 
And I'm going to walk you all through that in just a moment. Okay, so... Okay, so I've already mentioned that, that uh, the assessment of complex trauma involves assessing both exposure as well as the impact of that exposure. Uh, SAMHSA has provided a variety of tools and documents to aid in that assessment. So the first, of course, being the tools for assessing exposure, CTES and CTEA. Now, for the assessment of impairment only, you go to the NCTSN website, and here is the link for that. And if you don't remember the link, obviously, or don't have access to it, the website is fairly easy to navigate. You find the tab for trauma types, then you go to where it says complex trauma, and then it'll be pretty straightforward from there, assessment, a section on assessment, and then a section on standardized tools. And I'll walk you through that as well. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to actually walk you through using that website. Okay, so let me just back up a second. So assuming you've clicked on this link, it will take you directly to this section of the NCTSN website. And if you look at the far left, the way that we got there is trauma types, click on complex trauma, click on assessment, and then click on standardized measures. And then here is a list of measures, and these are not specifically complex trauma measures. These are measures that assess different domains of functioning and different domains of impairment and different types of symptoms. So you can look here and get a sense of which measure you want to use to assess which domain of impairment. And there's enough information to at least give you a starting point to figure out which would be the assessments you want to use. So it gives you the name of the measure, the author of the measure, it gives you the domains that are assessed, and these domains don't necessarily map on cleanly to the domains of impairment uh, listed by SAMHSA. In some cases, they are the domains developed by the developers of the instruments or the subscales. And this, this uh, portion of the website will be updated as well to support the efforts in New York State, so we'll see some changes here too in the coming months. It also provides information on the targeted age, which will be helpful in trying to make that determination for your client, and provides information based on whether it's a self-report or an interview, if it's standardized. And then the final column provides additional information, and it will either direct you to the publisher's website, for example, or there is a review of some of these measures available on the NCTSN website, which summarizes and provides a little bit uh, different types of information. Okay, so I'm just going to so assume that you scroll down the list and you've identified, let's say, the behavior rating inventory of executive functioning, the brief, as something that you want to know more about. And it's good for children between the ages of 5 to 18. It only takes about 10 or 15 minutes. You can give it to a teacher. You can give it to the caregiver. If you want more information, but you're not quite sure which domains, it says cognition here, but does it map onto any other domains also, you're not sure, and you have a client and you want to know if this is a good fit, then you could go to the publisher's website and read a little bit more about it. Or, and if you look down, another popular one is the CBCL, the Child Behavior Checklist. Again, if you want more information on, so here it says, for example, behavioral control, affect dysregulation. Let's say you want more information on how behavioral control does or does not align with the domains of impairment as identified by SAMHSA. You can go to the publisher's website or to the full measure review all the way on the right, and there will be more information available there. Okay. So now that you know a little bit about how to navigate the website and how to use that information, and again, I want to underscore that the, the information on that website wasn't developed for these particular purposes, but um, it will be updated in the coming months to support the efforts in New York. And if there are assessments that you think do tap into some of those, those domains of complex trauma as outlined by SAMHSA, there is a mechanism being developed for asking to have, submitting those assessments and asking to have them reviewed by the committee at NCTSN and then if they, if they pass the review, be added to the website. So now let's think about Zoe in terms of um, the domains of impairment that she's, uh, that, that, that she's exhibiting. Um, 
So again, you want to find at least impairments in at least two domains, and if it's only in one, you want to know if it's acute. So looking at that grid or those different domains of impairment, there's the emotional responses domain. One of the items beneath that is that the client may experience significant depression, anxiety, or anger. So for depression, I think at one point, and she narrates the film, which is nice because it makes it easy for us, and I know that children don't speak this way, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good way to um, illustrate what it is that we're looking for. She says that she's lost in the sorrow of my soul. So if a child comes to you and tells you that they feel sort of hopeless and they're sad all the time, then, you know, they're showing some evidence of depression, then you would say, okay, then that would fit into the impairment domain of emotional responses. She also seems to emotionally tune out. So at one point there is a scene where she's eating breakfast with her foster mother, and her, it looks like her foster mother is trying to engage her in conversation, and she's not really interacting or even really looking at her. There's this sort of blank expression on her face. So you would want to look for something that assesses uh, emotionally tuning out or numbing out or avoidance or dissociative responses perhaps even. So you're thinking, okay, you need to find um, a measure that looks at those different things. Impulse control and self-regulation, you see her destroy a record player, rip up a book. So I think it's safe to say that she's got some difficulty with self-regulation and impulse control. Of relationships with others, I think it would be safe here as well to say that she's got difficulty forming healthy attachments quite understandably and trusting new people. And she talks about that in the film as well. And then as far as self-image, she talks about feeling powerless and having few hopes or dreams, unable to hope or dream. So right off the bat with just those few minutes, those four minutes of the video, we see that she actually would meet criteria for at least four domains of impairment and you only need two. So the brief is, you know, there are many different measures and I'm not endorsing one measure over another. I think I, I picked this one just because it was, it was quick and it was simple to understand and just wanted to illustrate how you would go onto the developer's website, look up how they define their subscales and then match them onto the domains, one of those seven domains as outlined by SAMHSA and CMS. So Imagine you've got those seven domains, and this is just a subset of the subscales uh, assessed by the, uh, on the brief. And so inhibit, for example, this is when children often have trouble resisting impulses, uh, a general failure to look before leaping, a tendency to interrupt and disrupt activities, um, high levels of physical activity. So this would map on fairly nicely to the impulse control and self-regulation domain as defined by SAMHSA. And you look at the, uh, the next subscale, shifting, which is really the ability to make transitions, tolerate change, problem solve flexibly. So again, thinking of the domains of impairment outlined by SAMHSA, there's uh, the cognitive processes, which, uh, which also includes trouble thinking a problem through calmly and considering multiple alternatives. So that's really right. It's essentially problem solving flexibly is what they're talking about. So I would say that that this subscale might tap into some of those cognitive processes that we're looking for as well. And then emotional control is really about having an age-appropriate level of emotional control and reacting to events in an appropriate way without emotional outbursts, without sudden or frequent mood changes, and or excessive periods of feeling upset. So that would map on fairly nicely to the emotional responses domain as outlined by SAMHSA, which really talks about managing emotions and experiencing significant depression, anxiety, or anger. So there's a little bit of, um, I guess, detective work if you're not familiar with some of the measures involved here, and if you already use standardized measures, as I hope many, many clinicians and agencies do, you can look at some of those measures that you already use and just start to think about them through a different lens. How do those measures tap into some of these seven domains? And there's no sense in reinventing the wheel if you already have things that you're using that you think map on nicely. However, if you're working with a client and you, um, and you think that the measures that you have might not map on or might not fully capture what they're experiencing or what they're exhibiting, you can think about, okay, I think this person's really exhibiting a lot of difficulty with uh, somatic complaints and sense of self, and I think that's where they're really going to, to hit that mark on the eligibility determination form. So let me hop onto the NCTSN website and see if I can find an assessment that taps into those domains a little bit better than what we already have. <laughs> 
And these are just a couple of other uh, examples of things that are on the website. So for example, the Strengths and Difficulties questionnaire has a subscale called Peer Relationship Problems. And that might map onto at least part of the relationships with other domain. It doesn't include uh, relationships with adults. So if you have a child that's struggling with relationships with peers, then this would be a good way to capture it. But if you know that they're pretty good with their, with their friends and same age peers, but they have difficulty with people in authority or their caregivers, then you might want to look for a different measure. Or the uh, CBCL has a, a, a domain, a category for somatic complaints, and that would map on to the physiology domain as well, as defined by SAMHSA. So now you've completed that first part of the complex trauma eligibility determination form that I mentioned earlier. And you've already indicated at that top portion the different types of traumatic exposures that the child has had, how long they've had them, whether or not it's, it's acute. And so here you've got the impairment category, and so presumably you've already started to think about the impairments that you've seen in your client, and you've identified some different ways from that website to assess those impairments. And so again, think of, thinking about Zoe, I think we had already identified a few different domains, so we would check off here under present yes or no. We would check off emotional responses, impulse control and self-regulation. I might put a, under acute, I might put a yes for that one, just based on what we've seen. Self-image, yes. Relationships with others, yes. And there might even be a few others, but because we're just basing it on what we've seen in the video, we can leave it at that. And then you would fill in how you arrived at that decision, so what instrument or method you used. And part of that could be through a clinical interview, but you would want to supplement it with one of the measures on the website. So you would say something like, you know, interview and child behavior checklist, or interview and youth outcome questionnaire. And then any other additional comments about the onset duration or description of the details of what you're seeing that you think would be helpful. Okay, and once you've done that, then you've essentially completed both the complex trauma exposure assessment as well as the complex trauma eligibility determination form. And uh, you would then, at that point, make a determination linking their exposure to the difficulties that they're having. So I think, you know, before wrapping up, I just wanted one final note about young children and complex trauma. So the impact of complex trauma is so pervasive, and when working with young children especially, very young children, zero to three, zero to five, we made an exception for the, for the chronicity uh, requirement, because at that age they are so, so dependent on a caregiver that they trust for all their basic needs that to have a requirement of 18 months would just be, be way too long. So there really is latitude for, for clinicians to make those decisions. So if you have any questions or comments or concerns, please uh, feel free to contact us at the uh, links or the email addresses below. And for additional resources, you can go to either the New York State Department of Health website, the McSilver website, the NCTSN website. There are lots of good resources out there, and I encourage you to take a look at them and feel free to ask any questions, and uh, have a great day. Thank you.